Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. As the extremely charming Danoa brothers said, my name is Vai Gomez, and I'm here to talk to you about something really important to me today. Last school year, the 7-0 school division implemented and released a policy surrounding anti-racism. This policy centered around creating a safe environment for all in the division, and it promised to create anti-racist spaces for students, staff members, and any other individual involved with the work. Why? Why do we need anti-racism in our school division? So why do we need it in our classrooms? Why do we need to talk to our students about it? What is its purpose? Why do we need policies for these things? Why do we need task forces? What is anti-racism and its place in education? That is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Not answer, mind you, but just talk about it. And I hope that when we leave here today and when you go home, you too feel the need to talk about it. But before we continue, I'd like to ask you, my audience, two quick questions. And if they apply to you, please raise your hands. Don't feel afraid to not participate. My first question is, who here has heard the term anti-racism before? Thank you so much. Now for my second question, who here has heard the term anti-racism five years ago? Please don't be afraid to not raise your hand or to raise it. We have a few outliers. See, the reason I always ask that question when I talk about anti-racism is because I'm always interested in learning how far back the knowledge of it goes, how much is it aware in the social you know, sphere. I myself hadn't heard about it until two or three years ago, and I didn't begin work with anti-racism until about a year and a half ago. You see, we've heard terms like racism and racist and non-racist or passive racist or even anti-racist hundreds of times. You know, whether they're words we have a superficial understanding of, or their terms you're intimately familiar with. I'd like to quickly go through three terms I'm going to use today. So I'll begin with the racist. So what is a racist? The definitions are varied. To some, a racist is an individual, somebody who uses slurs and hateful language and actively targets people of color. It's an individual action. To others, a racist can use a cultural hierarchy. They take attributes that apply to them and people they think they belong to, cultural standards, and they place themselves at the top of a hierarchy they make. And anybody who doesn't fit those standards is below them. Now finally, to some people, racism is a system. It is an institute which has no senior executives who are people of color. It is a political office that has failed or ignored to reach the needs of a community. All of these definitions are correct. There is no singular box we can trap racism into, no level we can isolate it singularly to examine. But what about passive racists, or sometimes they like to call themselves non-racists? Well, I'm sure, you know, as we've established, that the term anti-racism hadn't been around for a long time. A lot of people here hadn't heard about it, including me. So what is a non-racist? Well, a non-racist is somebody who claims they're not racist because they're not like a racist. They don't say slurs or demeaning things. They don't actively target people of color consciously. But you see, this is a fallacy. This is a lie. When we're born into a world and socialized into it, where a world which is actively racist, it holds prejudices, biases, and stereotypes, it is impossible for us as individuals to not take these things in. When individuals around us hold prejudices, individuals we idolize or like or just friends with, it is impossible for us to not take these things in as we grow up. Therefore, it is impossible for us to not be racist. This isn't a bad thing to admit that we are racist. It's simply an admittance of truth. To begin the work, we have to realize that. It allows us to work on ourselves, to examine the prejudices we hold, to make ourselves and the environments we occupy better. But what about, finally, anti-racist? Well, before that, I'd like, to admit to you some, I'd like to admit something to you, which kind of leads back to my former point. I'd like to admit that I am a racist, too, because as we established, where none of us are not racist. I'd like to take you on this journey with me. But before, I don't want to just accuse you, my audience, of being racist without first admitting it myself. I admit that I am a racist, that I hold prejudices and stereotypes and biases. But I also admit that these are simply that, prejudices, biases, and stereotypes, nothing more, and that I am working on them. And I hope that when you go home today, you too can have that conversation with yourself. So 
Like I said, moving on to anti-racist. What is that? What does it truly mean? Confusing term for some people. It is, after all, newer, and it's often used in academic language or social issues which people don't always pay attention to. Anti-racism has varied definitions too. Some people say that it is simply introspection, looking into ourselves, seeing what we're thinking, and some say that it is merely opposition to racism. Others say that it is a useless and frivolous term invented by people of color and used as an excuse to shovel off the effects they have on, you know, that society has on them and that they have on society. Today, I will give you my definition of anti-racist or an anti-racism. Anti-racism is an active process. There is no passive anti-racist. It is an oxymoron. To be anti-racist, we have to be active. We have to be active against our own prejudices. We have to be active against our environments to ensure they're better. We have to be active in creating equitable opportunities for all. So now that we've established these things, where do these ideas relate and correlate? You see, I'm going to ask you to stop being a non-racist and be an anti-racist. Because, in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., shallow understanding from people of goodwill is often more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding of people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And that is what non-racism is, or passive racism. It is simply lukewarm acceptance. So where does education come into place here? I've defined these terms, I've told them to you, I've given examples. Where does education come into place here? Well, education is an institute, it is a system. And to be anti-racist, we have to recognize that when systems have been actively disadvantageous and hostile towards people of color, that they are racist. We have to recognize these things to make our systems better, or to at least, at the very least, change them. I'd like to quickly talk to you about my experience in the Manitoba education system. You see, I joined it in middle school, specifically grade six. And I stayed through till now in my last year of high school. My middle school was right here in the Seven Oaks School Division. And even though this was just less than six years ago when I joined it, I did not learn a single substantial thing about indigenous people until my second year of high school. That is an example of racism in our education system. When our staff are not trained in cultural sensitivity training and racial sensitivity training, that is racism. When our indigenous students have approximately a 50% on-time graduation rate compared to our non-indigenous students of 90%, that is racism. When our teachers who have worked with their coworkers for years and months have to tell them how to correctly pronounce their names, that is racism. That is the racism that clouds our systems, that persists when we allow it to. And that is this racism that we have to be active against. An action we have taken, we being administrators, staff, and students. You see, I mentioned the anti-racism policy at the beginning of my talk. You see, after it was implemented and released at the end of last year, the Seven Oaks School Division created a task force. The purpose of this task force was to implement the many points in a long and lengthy um, policy. But mainly, to summarize, its purpose was to create a culture of anti-racism around you know, educational sites and schools across the division, and to help educate educators on how to be anti-racist. I joined this task force at the beginning of the school year, and I'm not going to lie, to me, in my perspective, a lot of it was really boring paperwork. And it was slow going. See, it was work that had been motivated and centered by the events of 2020 the murder of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter protests, the pandemic forcing us back into our homes, forcing social media to be our only window into the world, created a really public eye on these events. But as most of you might know, 2020 was two years ago. And like a lot of things, the enthusiasm motivating this work had, in my opinion, died out. So where did that leave this task force? Well, it left it with one individual who the division had asked to return to work on the task force to create, you know, help create events, presentations, and organize things. And accompanying that one individual was an unpaid high school intern, me. Now, I might be creating a pretty bleak image here, but I just have to tell you that this was the reality of the situation, in my opinion. 
This is the reality of the situation. A lot of activists and social change across the world. When work begins, it is often slow going. It is often boring. It requires a lot of groundwork. I don't mean to be bleak. I just mean to be accurate. But you see, as the year went by, something really interesting happened. Educators from across the division, people who had busy responsibilities already as teachers and people who had personal lives, began to join the task force in a much more permanent and solid way. They gave more of themselves and did more than anybody could have ever asked of them. And I am so grateful to them for joining us. They joined the task force and lifted it from one very enthusiastic individual in a small room with an unpaid high school intern to six individuals with a burning passion. And that's not even counting the 40 other educators in the division who joined us in a much more fluid and effective way. And the students, the students we talked to, we presented to, their passion for positive social change was so intense that it was a learning moment for all of us. So, what now? Where does this go? Is it all daisies and sunshine? Is it a rags to riches story where we began from nowhere and are now somewhere effective? No, it isn't, because that's just in fairy tales and movies. The real world is a lot more ebb and flow. Things gain and things lose. The work we've started now will take years. It will lose funding and it will gain funding at times. It will lose and gain enthusiasm. This is simply the reality of the work. And even though this work will take years, and this is a single school division of the entire city, if this work is never faced, it will never be fixed. And the words of James Baldwin, if nothing that, excuse me, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. This is the end of my talk. So before I leave you, I'm going to ask you to be active, to go home today and refuse to be passive, to take steps, to talk, to do things, because this work is needed. It helps you, it helps me, it helps your fellow classmates, it helps your teachers, it helps your fellow co workers, it helps everybody. Because anti racism is not an easy fix to our work, but it is definitely a necessary one. Thank you so much for having me.